Welcome to Wicked Problems, Wolfpack Solutions. Tonight is the first live stream event in the series, and this will be the only event in which there are, in fact, no problems, though we will be talking about the end of the universe. Uh, my name is Matt Shipman. I'm the research communications lead at NC State University, and this evening I'll be talking with Dr. Katie Mack. Katie is an assistant professor of physics at NC State and the author of a fantastic book called The End of Everything. She is an expert on the universe. So we're gonna be covering a few billion years worth of material here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, Katie, you're a cosmologist. Mm -hmm. What is a cosmologist? Well, um, so first of all, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here to be talking to everybody. Um, a cosmologist is uh, somebody who studies the universe uh, from beginning to end, from the largest scales to the smallest scales, what the universe is made of, how it works, um, all of those aspects of the sort of function and evolution and uh, origins and fate of the cosmos. Okay. So like one of the things that I think a lot of people, it's not that they, it's not something that they know about cosmology, but it's something that they think they know about cosmology. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, is the Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. but our understanding of the Big Bang has actually evolved quite a bit um, over the past 50 years or so. So how would you describe our current understanding of the Big Bang? Yeah, the, the Big Bang Theory is, is I think, um, one of the most, the most uh, talked about things in cosmology. One of the things that, that you know, you saw, talk about the Big Bang and people on the street are like, yeah, I know about the Big Bang. Um, but when it was first sort of brought to the public eye, uh, you know, maybe in the sort of 70s or 80s, it was, uh, it was very different from how we talk about the origin of the universe today. So people usually think of the Big Bang as a singularity, a, an infinitesimally small point, and then some kind of explosion into, into space or, or um, you know, and, and then that creates the universe. And uh, we we actually don't have any reason to believe there was ever a singularity. There was ever a sort of uh, infinitely dense point at the beginning of time. Um, that idea comes from taking the uh, the fact that the universe is is now large and it's expanding and dialing that back and using uh, our theory of gravity, general relativity, Einstein's theory, and just extrapolating back and. And if you do that, the equations lead to this infinitely dense point. But we actually have really good reason to believe that that is not how it went. It, it didn't go from, from just tiny point and then explosion, you know, kind of uh, expansion straight from there. Um, when we talk about the Big Bang Theory as cosmologists, we are talking about the idea that in the past, the universe was hotter and denser and in some sense smaller than it is today. And we do get that just from extrapolating backwards saying the universe is currently expanding. It must have been smaller and hotter and denser in the past. Um, and we have really direct evidence of that, which is very cool, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a moment. But the idea that, that it goes all the way back to a singularity, um, actually, we, we based on our observations, something must have happened in between. If there was a singularity at all, then something must have happened between that and what we see today to explain what we see in the universe. Um, but we are very, very sure that the universe was hot and dense in the past. Uh, so hot and dense that, that all of space was full of like fiery plasma. And the reason we know that is because we can actually see it. Because if we look out into the universe far enough away, we are seeing light that has taken so long to reach us. It's taken, you know, the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years to reach us. And that means that that light has been traveling since the time the universe was just beginning, since, since the time the universe was hot and dense and in this sort of fireball state. And so that means we can actually see the fire. <laughs> we see the Big Bang. We see the, the light from the Big Bang. We call that the cosmic microwave background because it comes to us as microwave radiation, which is just a kind of, a kind of light, a kind of electromagnetic radiation. Um, but we see that light very directly. And so we can actually see the universe in its primordial fiery state in the, the process of the Big Bang. And so, so 
this cosmic background radiation, the, the sort mm -hmm. of like light echo of the creation of the universe, what can we, what can we extrapolate from that? What can we learn from that? Yeah, so, so the biggest thing we learn is that the universe was, you know, it was hot and dense and glowing with heat in, the, in its first 13.8, or its first uh, 380,000 years um, in the very beginning. Uh, the other thing we can do with that light is we can look at the little fluctuations in that light. So, so there are some, when we, when we look at this, we're, we're sort of looking out at the farthest reaches of the universe. The most distant thing we can see is the, that background light. And in some places it's a little bit hotter and some places it's a little bit cooler. And that's because when the universe was this sort of hot, dense, fiery universe, it was sort of churning and, and humming and vibrating. And, and there were places where it was a little bit hotter and, and denser and, and places where it was a little bit cooler. And, and so there was like, it was a little bit bumpy, right? So it wasn't and totally homogenous. It wasn't totally, yeah, it wasn't totally homogenous. It, was, it actually had sound waves going through it. We can see the imprint of those sound waves, which is very cool. Um, but what we what we can observe is, is that the places where it was a little bit more dense, um, over time, those would grow into, you know, clusters of galaxies, the largest structures we know of, and places where it was, was a little bit less dense that grows into voids, giant empty spaces in the universe. And by looking at those patterns and seeing, you know, what happens to the light as it passes through all the rest of the universe, we learn about what the universe is made of. We learn about the components of the universe. We learn about the evolution of the cosmos, how the expansion has been happening since that early time uh, up to today. And uh, we can even get sort of hints about how the universe is going to go in the future, how it'll end based on what we learn by looking at that background light from the very early stages. Right. So, so, but that's, I mean, so that's one source of pretty amazing source of information or observation that we can use to understand things. What are some of the other sort of phenomena or tools that we can use to understand things at that, at the universal level? Yeah, so in cosmology, the most of what we're doing is we're looking out into the distance in order to look into the past, right? Because the farther away we look, the farther back in time we're looking. And so we can use any distant objects to learn about the history of the universe. We can learn, we can look at distant galaxies, uh, distant clusters of galaxies, uh, supernovae that went off in distant galaxies. Um, and so as we look at these other galaxies, we're seeing the light as it was when it left those galaxies when the universe was much younger, much smaller. And so we can count up like how many galaxies there were, how close they were together, when they formed, um, just by looking at really, really distant objects. So it's kind of like it's kind of like we have this timeline uh, going out from you know the present now here to the past very far away. And we can look at everything along that timeline. Uh, and that's just the distance. You know, it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a space line, but it's also a timeline because of right. this speed of light. And we have that in every direction. Every direction we look, we can stretch out a ruler uh, in terms of how far away we're looking and see the past in every direction. And so we can, we can fill in this really amazing map of not only the, the space of the universe, but also the, the time of the universe, the, the past, the history of the universe. So, so the various types of, the various telescope type tools that we have are effectively windows in time. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like the Hubble Space Telescope can see galaxies that existed within the first like 500 million years of the universe. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. So, you know, the first 500 million years, like first half a billion years, that's that's a long time ago. That's very, very early stuff. And we're getting new telescopes soon that like the James Webb Space Telescope the sort of successor of Hubble that's going to see even, you know, maybe some of the earliest galaxies that ever formed in the universe. And it's going to tell us about how galaxy formation even happens, what, you know, what galaxies were made of at that time and how, how the first stars came together and so on. So, um, sorry, this is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so based on, based on all of this, all this data that, that we've been collecting, that humans have been collecting through looking at the sky, mm -hmm. um, and then with more, much more modern tools within the past century, 
based on all this information that we have, what needed to happen for the conditions to exist for there to be life, right? Like anywhere, yeah. not, not just yeah. us, but just like life at all. Yeah, that, and that's a, that's a great question. I mean, in terms of the conditions for life on sort of a single planet, there are, there are things we think we know, um, you know, based on sort of extrapolating from earth life, we know that earth life needs water, it needs a source of energy like the sun, or maybe potentially a hydrothermal vent or something like that. Um, and, uh, and we, and it needs certain sort of molecules like uh, amino acids, things like that. And we know that those conditions do exist fairly frequently in the universe. So we think it's, it's probably true that, that there's life in a lot of places in the universe now, whether or not there has been life, you know, all along the timeline, that's a different question. And, and we, we can definitely see that there, there were times in the distant, you you know, in the past in the universe where there just couldn't have been any kind of life that we know about, you know, when the universe was in this sort of fiery state at the beginning, you know, when there was, when the whole cosmos was full of this sort of humming plasma, we don't think there's anything that could have lived in that. It was just, it's just way too hot. And then, you know, then after that, the, the, that fire cooled, then the universe was mostly this kind of neutral hydrogen gas. And then that, came together to form the first stars and the first galaxies. And so when the first stars and galaxies formed, that sort of set up the conditions for the structure that life needs, uh, the, the, um, you know, something to live on, uh, something to drive energy from. But we don't think that'll continue into the indefinite future because as the universe is evolving and changing, the way it's evolving and changing is that things are getting farther apart. Uh, matter is getting more diffuse. Energy is getting more diffuse. So, so the universe is expanding. And I, I said that a couple of times. What I, what I mean by that is that we see that galaxies are getting farther apart from each other. Distant mm-hmm. galaxies are, are getting farther apart from each other. So there's kind of more empty space all the time in between things. Right. And one of the things that does is it makes it less common for galaxies to collide with each other and bring new gas in to create new stars because galaxy collisions are one of the ways that big bursts of star formation happens. And and as galaxies evolve, as time goes on, the the hydrogen gas that's inside those galaxies gets turned into stars and then those stars sort of burn out or or explode or whatever. And so galaxies can kind of use up their gas. And so over time, it's harder and harder to make new stars and harder and harder, therefore, to make new planets. And then, you know, that makes it less hospitable to life. And so we can actually see, based on our observations of the distant past, that star formation was much more common early on in the universe, um, you know, maybe in the first, uh, like, half a dozen billion years, there, or even earlier than that, um, the first few billion years, star formation was really common. There were there was a lot of hydrogen gas. There were a lot of galaxies colliding with each other. There was big bursts of star formation, and it's been slowing down since then, since the first few billion years. And Has it slowed down so like we're in the sweet spot, or are we sort of after the sweet spot? After yeah, no, no, we're yeah. You can, so you can calculate how many stars have formed so far in the universe, and how many we expect to form in the future, right? And uh, about about how how far in do you think we are? It's not fifty percent. Seventy percent. Ninety or ninety five. Ah. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. So like ninety or ninety five percent of all the stars that ever were or ever will be have already formed. So we're we're in the we're in the kind of winding down middle age kind of like senior citizen part of the universe right now. The early <laughs> like the conditions, special era of the universe. Yeah. I mean, the conditions are, are pretty good for life right now. You might you might even think you don't want to live when the stars were at their peak formation time because there were lots of supernovae going off all the time. And you don't want to be near a supernova when that happens, right? right. So so and when there's lots of galaxies colliding, you get more galactic activity. You get, you know, sort of burst, you know, jets of radiation. No, that's not great. Um, so maybe it's better to live kind of in this sort of latter times when everything's kind of calming down and you have, uh, you know, a bunch of sort of middle-aged stars and their middle-aged planets. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you fast forward hundred billion years in the future, uh, you know, the stars are basically done by then. There are very few stars that live much longer than that. And 
you know, it'll be, it'll be a lot harder to have any kind of, uh, any kind of new life forming then. So, so we are kind of, we are kind of in, in this period of time in the universe where stuff can happen and we can discover things, uh, but that doesn't last forever. Okay. So, um, so very quickly before I forget, I just want to, so some of our viewers are NC State students, many of them. And we also have viewers who are watching on YouTube Live uh, from wherever in the universe. Hello, viewers. Um, but the NC State students can ask us questions and we encourage you to do so. Um, so uh, I know we've already got a few coming in. We're gonna get to those in just a second. I had one more question I wanted to make sure that I asked. I'm not going to ask about all the ways that the universe might end because mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Mack wrote an entire book about it and we don't have that kind of time on our hands um, to go through a book's worth of stuff. But a lot of people, how do I phrase this? So one of the things that I think is pretty common is a lot of people think about just the concept of the universe ending and it mm -hmm. find it totally overwhelming, mm. right? So, yeah. or, or depressing or sad or whatever. Yeah. But I've read the book and I know that you don't feel that way. So like what perspective do you have on the end of everything? Yeah, I mean, this is something that that I really, I kind of, I kind of struggled through in the writing of the book, like trying to find a way to relate to that idea um, and not have it just be sad, right? right. Um, and and uh, and in the process of writing the book, I I went and, and talked to a lot of my colleagues, a lot of um, a lot of cosmologists and physicists, and some of the the most eminent people in the field, and I asked everybody, you know questions about their research, questions about the fate of the cosmos, uh, the latest science, the new observations that are coming up, what they're excited about, all that. But I also made sure that every time I went for one of these interviews, I also made sure to ask, how does the end of the universe make you feel? Right. And, uh, and, and I wanted to know like how they sort of emotionally internalize this stuff as they're working all, every day on, you know, the fate of the cosmos. And there was a huge range of responses. You know, some people, um, you know, a couple of people said they thought it sounded really depressing that the universe uh, sort of fades out and everything gets cold and dark and, and whatever. Uh, a few people were like, yeah, it's fine. That's how it should be. We should just be a kind of little blip. It's all good. Um, uh, one, one person uh, said, you know, I, I don't think anything about the end of the universe. Like, you know, I, I, I'll be, I'll be happy if we figure out what to do about climate change. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind uh, what's going to happen in, you know, a hundred billion, you know, trillion years, whatever. Right. Um, but, uh, but I think for me, what, what it came down to was just a different sort of perspective on the cosmos and a different perspective on like where we fit into this big story, you know, um, the, the cosmos, the universe has its own story. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. Uh, and we are, we are fortunate enough to be able to learn about that, to be able to observe pieces of that story, to figure out how it all fits together. And we can find kind of our own place in that. And, you know, maybe there's no great meaning to the universe, you know, depending on how you, you know, what your beliefs might be, there may or may not be a, 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 an essential purpose to the cosmos, you know, if it's going to end, and everything's just going to fade away. And, you know, maybe like, you might think, well, maybe nothing matters. But I think for me, what what I get out of that is that we we need to find the meaning in the cosmos, or in our lives, in what we're doing now, and, and that that meaning that we create that meaning that we, uh, we discover, that's that's important and and we can see ourselves fitting into this bigger picture fitting into this larger story and and find meaning in just in that in being part of that larger perspective right i mean if everything is finite like everything is finite then that mm -hmm. makes everything that much more precious really yeah I, yeah absolutely yeah so um so advancing our understanding of the universe is i think inherently interesting Right. Mm -hmm. Like I, I at least find it incredibly interesting. Yeah. Does it have like a practical utility at all? Like, is there. Um, uh, so the, the short answer is we have no idea. Right. Um, when uh, when when theoretical physicists of the past were working on esoteric things that were 
you know, big important questions. Many times those things turned out to be immensely practical in ways that were not nobody could have predicted, right? When when people were working on electricity, I mean, nobody knew that was going to be useful when it was first discovered. When people were working on uh, quantum mechanics, uh, nobody knew that that would be, you know, underlying everything that happens inside of your cell phone uh, and and would allow us to do all this amazing uh, technology. When, when people, uh, you know, when Einstein came up with general relativity, the, this idea that space-time bends around massive objects in space and it changes how time flows. Uh, nobody thought that would have any any uh, practical usage, but now, you know, if you use a GPS uh, thing in your phone, you're using general relativity every day. Uh, so it's, it's very possible that by asking these big esoteric questions, by really trying to push the boundaries of our knowledge of physics and, and the universe and how it works, we will find something that will have a practical use in the future and we'll have no way of predicting what that will be. And, and we've found time and time again that there's there's just a huge return of invest, return on investment of doing basic research, especially in, in something like fundamental physics. But I think, you know, I mean, so there's, there's a sort of economic or practical argument for it. Um, right. But I think for me, the, the reason that we should do this kind of science is because like human humans want to know stuff like that's that's just that's part of what what makes us humans right like we are curious and we you know we we want to understand the world around us and it's it's that instinct i guess has served us well over the you know millennia that we've been around or whatever but it's it's just it's it's part of our basic humanity that we want to know the answers to these big questions. And so I think that there is a basic good in like indulging that, that human instinct and trying to, um, you know, increase our knowledge and, and uh, increase everyone's access to that knowledge. I think that's just, that's just a, a good, a basic human good. Okay. So, um, so this sort of, I think segues pretty well. Um, one of the students, Ryan, would like to know what it's like trying to solve the mysteries of the universe. And are there some things that are just unsolvable? Are there some things that we just can't know? Yeah, so I think that there probably are some things that we will never know. I mean, we will not personally see the end of the universe. So we will not know exactly how that's gonna go, right? Um, There are also, sorry? Not for long, anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, and there, there are also uh, there, there are also some basic limits to our knowledge that are built into how physics works, as far as we understand. Like, there's there's a limit to what we can know about the smallest scales because things get very sort of wiggly on the in in a quantum mechanical way, mm-hmm. uncertain uh, on very small scales. There's also a limit in the, on the largest scales where there's, there's a, a limit to how far we can see in the cosmos, how, how far we can get information from because of how long it takes light to travel from the most distant reaches. Um, so there are some hard limits to what we can know, mm-hmm. but, uh, for me, like I, I find it, I find it very rewarding to work on questions like this because, you know, maybe we can learn a little bit, maybe we can get a little bit closer to something that might give us some insight into the way the universe works. And even, even if my part is just an infinitesimally tiny piece of a bigger picture, um, it's, it's nice to, to feel like I'm, I'm sort of contributing to that. Uh, And it's, it's just, it's just fun to play around with these big, you know, ideas. Uh, I, I just, I really enjoy that. And especially the, the part of physics that I work in um, is, is a part where I get to be really creative uh, where I, you know, I get to basically, I talk to the theorists and I find out what are, what are the big and interesting theories going on right now. And then I talk to the observers and I find out, you know, what are the telescopes you're going to build or, you know, I talk to the experimental physicists and ask about the new, uh, the new, like, uh, colliders or whatever. And I try and find ways to connect those things and say, well, if you're, if you're doing this observation, you might be able to, to learn about this model of how dark matter works, you know, and then that, that can tell us uh, something, something really cool. So that's, I, I, I just enjoy that a lot. So you mentioned dark matter. Um, mm-hmm. Another one of the student questions from Zach had to do with 
dark energy and dark matter. So for, for, our, for our viewers, what, what are dark energy and dark matter? Uh, and then yeah. Zach wanted to know how those things influence the universe. Yeah, so dark matter is, as far as we know, it's it's a kind of matter. So matter is something that has mass. It's, uh, you know, it has gravity. Um, so dark matter seems to be a kind of matter that just is invisible. It doesn't interact with light as far as we know. And so uh, we, we can't see it, but we can see how it acts on other things in the universe. We can see that, um, for example, stars that go around galaxies that are, you know, stars are sort of orbiting galaxies in these disky galaxy shapes, right? Um, we can see that those, some of those are moving faster than we would expect if, if only the matter we see is what's there. So there, that leads us to believe there's, there's more matter there that's holding those stars in. And there's, there are lots of ways you could interpret that particular ob observation and get to places other than extra matter, but we have other really compelling pieces of evidence that there is just this extra matter in the universe that's, that we can't see, which is not that unusual. There are other kinds of particles that we can't see that, that um, you know, don't interact with light, but interact other ways. Um, so it's some kind of new particle we don't know about yet that has this property, probably, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, but, uh, but that's dark matter. So dark matter just, it's, but it's, it's most of the matter in the universe, right? So it's like 80% or 85% of the matter in the universe. So it's a lot of the stuff that's out there. Mo galaxies are mostly dark matter, just a sprinkling of stars. Um, whereas dark energy is kind of the opposite thing. Dark energy is, it's also invisible. That's why we call them both dark because we right. can't see them. But dark energy is something that's making the universe expand faster. So I mentioned the universe is expanding. It's actually speeding up in its expansion. And we don't know why, but whatever is making it speed up in its expansion, we call that dark energy. So it's and, what's pushing the universe outward? Yeah, yeah, sort of. It's pushing things away from each other. <laughs> it's just accelerating this expansion that was already happening from the Big Bang. So it was the, the Big Bang caused the expansion to start you know, it started expanding and then it, it was slowing down because all the gravity of all the stuff in the universe was pulling together, kind of putting the brakes on the expansion. And then, you know, something like five or six billion years ago, it started speeding up again. Uh, and that speeding up is due to something and we call that something dark energy and we don't know that much about it. So, you know, we don't know why it's, um, we don't know why it, it sort of, uh, is doing what it's doing. We think that probably it's something that was already, that was always part of the universe, part always part of how the universe worked. And the reason it, it just started getting, uh, started making the universe expand faster uh, in the last sort of five or 6 billion years is because um, the universe got big enough that the gravity that was slowing everything down was weaker because everything was farther apart. And so then this, this pushing kind of took over. That's really cool. <laughs> Um, okay, so this next question I also think is super cool. This one's from Catherine. She wants to know if we've found evidence of life outside of Earth. Um, and if we haven't found some, uh, evidence of life yet, do we have likely suspects, like places where we right. think we, were, we would be more likely to find life? Right, yeah, so so we have not, we have not, found anything that that I think the scientific community would agree is a sign of life elsewhere. Um, I, I'm putting a lot of caveats on that because there have been little detections of things various times where people have been like, oh, maybe that could be a biosignature or whatever. Like, but we don't, we, nobody's like uh, said, okay, definitely this is it. Um, or at least, you know, we haven't agreed on <laughs> definitely this is it. Uh, but there, there are some places that we, we do think are good to look, right? So there's Mars is one place where we're definitely looking. Um, we're looking partially for past life because we know that the conditions on Mars in its early uh, millennia, you know, um, early on in, in Mars's history, a billion years ago or something, it had conditions that were much more favorable to life. As far as we know, it had uh, liquid water on the surface, had a thicker atmosphere, uh, it was warmer. So, so there was liquid water on the surface of Mars in the past. And, and we think liquid water 
is something that that is conducive to life. Uh, so maybe there was life on Mars, and so we're we're definitely looking for it. Like the the Perseverance rover that's there now is designed to look for past, signs of past life, or or present life even. Um, although that's the harder to see how it would still be there. Right. Um, and then there are also a couple other places in the solar system where we know there's liquid water uh, in weird ways. So some of the moons of the gas giants, uh, Saturn and Jupiter, have um, water under their surfaces. So they have like maybe an icy surface that's a few kilometers thick, and then there's a liquid water ocean under that. Uh, so there are a few of those little moons that have some a setup sort of like that, and maybe even like hydrothermal vents underneath right. where where water where life could totally take hold if if the conditions are right, if you know, if the right molecules are there. So and um, are these like the actual small moons? I know some of the moons around the gas giants are actually ginormous. Uh, no, so these are, these are, uh, I don't know, I, I think these are sort of like medium to large ones. They're not, they're not like the tiny little rocks that are in Saturn's rings or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they're big enough that they can have, uh, you know, a, a sort of ocean inside them. Um, but I mean, things like, uh, you know, Europa and, and Ganymede and, and, and uh, or Enceladus uh, the, um, and Saturn's moon Titan, which is also really cool because it has, a liquid ocean of, of hydrocarbons on the surface. Um, and then it has liquid water under the surface also, which is kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, and then, and then we're also looking at planets that orbit other stars. So exoplanets uh, where we know that some of those are, you know, sort of the right size for, you know, similar size to, to the rocky planets of our solar system and orbiting their star from the right distance so that maybe they could have liquid water on their surfaces. We're not really sure because we can't mm -hmm. tell from here, but, but those are things that we're investigating more as well. Okay. So um, this is sort of, sort of related, I guess, uh, but uh, Rohan asked, um, so rather than finding life elsewhere in the universe. His, his question was more about how quickly we could take life into the universe. So like, oh, yeah. like how viable do you think it, it is that humanity could develop the necessary technology and become a multi-planetary species? Um, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's, that's a hard question. Uh, right now we have the capability to live in space. Um, you know, we have a space station, but it's constantly being restocked by earth. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's not far away. <laughs> so, uh, we didn't have to travel very far to get there. It takes you know, maybe six hours to get to the space station from earth, depending on the orbits. Right. Um, so, and, and we've we've taken people to the moon. They've spent a couple of days there, um, and so it is possible to live for a short time in a lot of places. I think, and w there's plans to to go to Mars. And you know, a lot of people talk about setting up uh, you know settlements of some kind or you know habitations on Mars. Um, and I mean, I think at the moment we're in the situation where it's kind of like kind of like living in Antarctica. Like you can. You can do it for a short time. You need to be resupplied by other places where, mm -hmm. where life is more sort of, you know, tolerated than that place. Right. Um, and I think, you know, we could, we, we, we have, you know, we could make a rocket powerful enough to take people to Mars. Um, we are pretty close, I think, to being able to land something safely on Mars that has people in it. Um, but probably when you get there, you're going to be living underground uh, in a in like a lava tube to protect from the radiation, and you're going to be in you know a pressurized habitat the whole time, and you're going to be living on food you brought with you because we don't yet know how to grow grow food there. Um, you know, maybe you can take water from the from from the ice under the soil to to replenish your water supplies. Right. Um, and maybe you can get oxygen out of that too. There's an instrument on the Perseverance rover that's that's making oxygen out of the um, carbon dioxide uh, in the air. Uh, but it's still it's not like a long term, uh, you know, living there situation. And maybe we'll get there. I mean, I think I think eventually uh, we'll probably find ways to solve the kinds of problems to 
to live there, but I don't know that it'll ever be practical in any way. You know, it, it'll, it'll probably always be like a kind of weird thing that, you know, explorers do, but it's not, I, I don't see us like having like a significant population on Mars anytime soon. Sure. So, so that's all like sort of near solar system. Yeah. <laughs> Beyond that. <laughs> so like, well, well, let me, let me yeah. re, re, recouch this, right. Or reframe mm-hmm. this, right. Because Rowan had a lot of questions. This question was really okay. involved and it's all okay. super interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but like, so if we think if we're thinking about things in terms of interstellar travel, right. Um, like, so I guess two different questions. Um, mm-hmm. One is like, is it even possible physically possible to create like say warp bubbles to travel in that way and then the other one is um what about stellar engines like or engines that would allow you to cross space in in a meaningful way um so in terms of the warp stuff uh as far as i know there's no physically plausible way to do that um like even just theoretically writing down the equations, uh, it's very hard to get something that that seems to theoretically work. And then it's like, well, okay, so you can do this if you learn how to bend space. <laughs> we do not know how to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't have whatever kind of weird matter you might need to to keep wormholes open or something like that. Like none of that stuff is is available to us. Um, and then in terms of engines, you know, there, there are really, uh, there've been some really cool, developments in spacecraft engines in the last couple decades, I guess, uh, ion drives and stuff like that. Um, so, it, you know, you might be able to get pretty fast, but for, for a trip like to another star, I mean, even to Alpha Centauri, the, that system, that's about 4.2 light years away or something like that. Um, it would take, based on current technology, it would take somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 years to get there. Uh, which is, you know, at that point you've got like ultra generation ships, right? Like it's not, it's not a trip that, that people just make. Um, so we don't have that technology yet. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll develop the kind of technology to go fast enough or, or, you know, continuously accelerate and somehow not get torn apart by like space dust. Um, and then, and then we can use relativity to make it within a lifetime, but by which I mean, if you, if you, if you get going fast enough, then then you then the time the distances get shorter basically uh, from your perspective. Um, so you might be able to survive a, a longer trip if you're going fast enough if you don't run into anything. Um, but that's that's still pretty far beyond our current technology. Right on. Okay. So um, Gabriel wanted to know he wanted to place everything that we've been talking about in context basically or she gabriel can go either way um so the question and i think that this is really perfectly phrased right so i'll just read it verbatim and that's was there anything before the universe formed this may be a weird way of saying it but where is the universe and i just (laughs) love that question yeah yeah um so we, so for for slightly technical reasons, we we do not we we have a lot of trouble tracing back to the ultimate origins of the universe. Okay, so this is the timeline as we as we think we know it right now, mm-hmm. going backward. The timeline is like there there was this expansion, um, you know, there was the hot dense state this, this cosmic microwave background that we see now before that, we think that there was a period of very rapid expansion called inflation where, uh, the universe, um, you know, sort of doubled in size over and over again and, uh, and just rapidly, rapidly expanded. And then when that, and then that expansion, that really rapid expansion sort of uh, when it ended, it dumped a whole bunch of energy into the universe, created the fireball cosmos that we see when we look at the cosmic microwave background. But this this inflation, if it happened, we have no idea what came before it. And there are there are theories, but it's it's really hard to um, to kind of extrapolate back before that based on our current knowledge, based on our current observations, because it sort of hides whatever happened before. Because it's like um, it's like there was, you know, there was sort of a universe 
And because of the expansion, it zoomed in on a tiny, tiny part of that universe. And then that's, that's our entire observable universe, right? Um, and so it's very hard to learn about what else was there. And we know there was a huge amount of space out beyond our observable universe. Our observable universe is a sort of bubble around us that's only like 46 billion light years in, in radius. That's only. how far we can see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, only. Um, that's how far we can see before we run into the fact that any light from beyond that bubble uh, would take more than the age of the universe to get to us because of the amount of space it has to traverse and the amount of time that it's had. Um, and so, you know, anyway, there was, so there, there was probably this inflation thing, but before that we have, we have very little idea of what happened. Maybe there was a singularity, maybe not, we don't know. Maybe we're part of some much larger space where there's like bubbles of universe coming out um, where there's little, a little inflation and then inflation ends, you create a little pocket universe and there's another one over there and they're sort of constantly getting farther apart from each other. Maybe there are higher dimensions of space and uh, you know, there's, we have our three dimensions of space here, and then maybe there's some fourth dimension that goes at right angles to all of our dimensions, and there's more space beyond that, and there's like a whole other universe out there. Like, we, we don't know. Um, so what, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard. It's like, it's like we're in the middle of a forest, and, you know, we can see the trees within our sight line. Right, um, and and we just can't see beyond those, and and we're we're in a bit of a situation like that uh, with the universe, where we're in the middle of it, or we're in we're inside the universe, and it's very hard to get the outside picture, if you know, it, in terms of like a global picture or or just perspective on what's beyond our observable universe, because we we don't have any information. So we, we're making a lot of extrapolations. We're, you know, doing our best with our mathematical models and trying to find things that, um, that uh, you know, are consistent. But we, you know, there's there's a limit to how much we can really know about anything beyond our observable universe. And we know that our observable universe is not the whole thing. Right. So it's a little, there's a little bit of a frustrating thing happening there. <laughs> Well, I think it's for, for Gabriel, it might be excellent news because it sounds like there's a real cracker of a problem yeah. for, for them to work on. Sure. Yeah. So, Gabriel, good question. Now get, get to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Dr. Mack, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, Thanks everybody for having me. who sent in questions, thank you so much. We had a lot of really good questions. I left a lot of them on the cutting room floor, and I apologize. Um, and uh, the Wicked Problems, Wolfpack Solutions, this is only the first one. There are going to be quite a few more. Uh, please come back. The others have actual problems that, that <laughs> you can solve um, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, entropy, which is insoluble. Yeah. Uh, and thanks so much, everybody. It was, it was wonderful having you with us this evening. Thanks, everyone.